when you have a guy like Cam, is it yeah. fair to say that uh, yeah, know, he dominates bit, every room he's in? That's right. He's the biggest star. Yeah, and, and that's and okay. He certainly took over the city. So when when Carolina drafted him, yep. What was the? It didn't. What he was, didn't come in like that. He didn't. It was a. In, in the best thing, I'll always obviously. I, I my time with Cam was amazing, and I'm always the first to point that out. The thing about Cam is when he came in as a rookie, he was not like the loudest voice in the room. He came in as a rookie and really earned his stripes and, and said, like, all right, I'm here to play ball. He won the starting job, had early success as a rookie, won rookie of the year. So there was like an ebbs and flow. He didn't come into the team and just say, like, all right, I'm here. You're welcome. I got this. He didn't. <laughs> well, y'all had Steve Smith on the team. We had Steve. So that wasn't going to happen with Jordan Steve, Jordan right? Gross, Ryan Khalil, Thomas right. Davis. I mean, that team was bringing back a lot of very – not only, like – good players, veteran players, but a lot of like strong leaders and strong personalities that could check that. So Cam by no means came in with that, but as time grew and it became the the reason that all that worked is Cam the the thing with Cam was he could be the biggest personality in the room. He could but everyone understood that Cam always put the football first. Hmm. Cam was always in a position where it never took away from his training, it never took away from his prep, it never took away from his performance. Like Cam was all about football. So we never like we never had to sit there and say, Oh, can you believe Cam wore that? Because it didn't matter. Like to the outside world, people thought it mattered. But the guys who lived with him every single day and saw him work and saw how much he cared and saw how much he poured into the sport, we never had to question any of the stuff he did because it never impacted what was important, which was the football. and never took away from that. And not everyone can handle that. Not everyone could balance that like Cam did. He was very unique in that, in that, in that regard. Mm. A lot of young guys would come in. They'd, oh, he's just Cam Newton. I'm going to go do what he does, and I'm going to dress, and I'm going to be in thing, and I'm going to be loud, and I'm going to be – but then they couldn't play, so it didn't work. You were annoying. Like you were, that's why Cam was so special. Like He could be both. Yeah, but well, it didn't happen overnight. So I, I'm curious about, and I, maybe you don't even know the answer to this. I mean, but like, you know, Cam comes back to Carolina after, you know, being in New England for a little while. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like, you know, every athlete's going to hit a point where they have to face the reality of the situation, mm -hmm. right? And, I, yeah. and I'm wondering if, if Cam had, has reached that point um, or if he hasn't handled the situation completely as well as he could like how long is he going to continue to play or is that you know? I don't know I, I it's hard to know how another guy feels right and I think it was probably unrealistic when, when he signed everyone was over the moon it was like you couldn't write that in a story in a storybook I just think there was a lot of moving parts there that just didn't didn't work right right the system then they brought him in and a week later they got rid of Joe Brady and then it was a new right. system and a new coach and then Sam was playing a little bit, then Cam would come in, then Cam was back out, and then Sam was in. It's a, you can't it, – it's just – it's an impossible way to play. I think the circumstances there – you know, listen, I'm sure Cam would be the first to say, like, I need to play better. I need, Of course. But, like, the whole situation surrounding that, to me, was just set up for it not to be overly smooth. That's what it seemed like. And at the time, Sam was hurt. They needed a quarterback. Cam was available. Brought a little life. You know, saw him. They won the first game. They went to Arizona. He threw a touchdown, ran for a touchdown in, like, the first two plays of the game. Everyone was – the city was on fire. It felt – you know, and then they kind of came back down a little bit. But, you know, the thing about Cam is he'll be done when he's ready to be done. You know what I mean? Like, he, the, no one works harder. No one's more vested into it. He has other interests. He has other things. But, like, he is super passionate and serious about football. How did you handle um, the retirement process? You know, the – I had a really interesting final year. So, I, you know, so the new regime here in Carolina came in, you know, with, with, with Rule and, and the new staff. And, and shortly thereafter, you know, they called me in and told me that they were going to let me go, which I kind of knew the writing was on the wall. Like for a new staff to come in and have an older guy with a strong opinion and a strong voice in the locker room, it's hard for a new young coach to kind of get their message and voice across to a bunch of young guys. Because huh. what they don't want is they don't want them hearing the message and then coming up to me and be like, what do you think, Greg? Right. And, and maybe I didn't agree. Maybe I did agree. But, like, typically when young when new coaches come in, especially from college, like, they want to make sure that it's a lot of younger voices that they can – that are going to buy into, like, this is how we do things. And that wasn't really necessarily always my approach. Like, I was always bought into the coach. But, like, if I didn't think it was great, like, I would go up to him and be like, no, we, this is a better way to do it. Like, so I wasn't surprised they got rid of me. I had a great conversations with, with Matt, with, with Rule after they hired him and Tepper and all them. And I, and I wasn't surprised when they let me go. 
I wanted to give it one last year. I signed with Seattle before COVID. So like we had these grand visions of like moving to Seattle and kids were going to go to school there and we were going to live on the West Coast and have this great experience out in Seattle. And then I signed there and like within the next month, COVID shut everything down. So we moved out to Seattle. There was like riots. The city was on fire. Oh, that's right. It was yeah. a lot going on that summer out there. Um, then COVID. So my family and I, we lived in like a high rise. They never came to a game. We had COVID testing. It was like all these restrictions, visitor. It was, a, it was an absolute disaster. And that was my last year. And so it wasn't exactly the last year that I had hoped for, but it very, you know, when is it ever? And, um, but I knew after that year, like it was time for me to move on. Like I've given everything I can. I got 14 years at this. I can't play the way I want. I can't run like I used to. I was getting hurt more than I ever did. I was like, it's time. Like I can't keep hanging on and doing this. I was never going to be that guy who just hung on because he was a good guy in the locker room. So I want to ask you, um, <clears throat> You mentioned Seattle and going from uh, Cal or Carolina to Seattle. So you played in Chicago. Is there a huge difference in the entire culture of an organization? Oh yeah. And um, is it profound to because uh, you know visually from the outside it looks like there's extreme differences in each organization and how successful they are and the the the, the um, reputation they yep. have right do you sense is that do you sense that when you're in the guts of it totally yeah and and and, and what you see from afar oftentimes aligns with once you're on the inside and oftentimes other times it doesn't yeah so i think you know the, the hardest thing for me looking back to go to a new team in my 14th year was tough yeah because i didn't have a lot of patience for like the bullshit like i didn't need all the like and going to Seattle, like, they're big thing. Now, listen, they win a lot. They win a lot. I, I always say Pete Carroll ran some of the best meetings, attention to detail. Like, the way they ran things there worked for them for a long time. It's just not my style. Like, I don't need hype men. I don't need cheerleaders. I don't need false enthusiasm. I don't need to be – I don't need all of that. I never have, but, like, especially at 37 years old, like, I was there to play ball. Like, to what time's practice start, I'll be there. I don't need anything like anything else to me is is irrelevant. So like it just you know, I saw things very particular like this is how I play. You know, I remember being in training camp there and like my tenant end coach being like, "Hey, I, I want to talk to you about your stance." I'm like, "What about it?" <laughs> so like, "Well, we think when you're in a two-point stance." I was like, "Listen, like I'm all about being a team guy. I'm coming here and I'm like really making an effort to adopt your approach and the way you want to do things and I'm buying in and I'll run routes but like there's some things that are just in my bones like yeah. you've got to just like let me be and and that it just it was always kind of like a tug right it was always kind of a back and forth between like you brought me here to play I'm 37 years old I play how I play I'm not saying it's the only way I'm not saying it's the way you need to teach the rest of the, the room but it's how I'm gonna play and if you don't let me play like this I'm not effective. So like that was, it, it was just hard. Like the way I always, I had a lot of freedom here in Carolina. Mm. My tight end coach, my coaches, they did not micromanage me. They trusted me. Now, there was also a lot of pressure when you get a lot of freedom because if you don't do it right, now they're pulling you in the room saying, hey, listen, buddy, I'm, I'm letting you do your thing here and you're making us look bad. So I, I felt like I internalized all that. Like I never wanted to let my coaches down ever because I feel like they trusted me to let me do things my way to a degree, like I owe it to them to go represent our room at the highest level. So like now I'm out there and I'm like, let me be like, I know what I'm doing. It might not be perfect. It might not be how you drew it up, but it's effective. Like go check it. It works. And they just, they weren't into that. Like they wanted everything to be, this is how we do it. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Like that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. You brought in a 30. What did you think you were getting when you brought me in? That mold has already been developed. Yeah, like, right? brother, that, that, that ship sailed, man. Like, right. I'm running my route how I run my route. If you don't like it, don't play me. I don't know what else to tell you, but it works. I had 15 years of yeah. proof that this <laughs> works. So, like, it was just – had a great – Russell was awesome. He was great. I mean, you talk about a guy with an approach and a mindset. He's really impressive. It just wasn't a good fit, you know. So, I look back on that. Like, it wasn't the ideal way to end my career, but, uh, you know – it's never a storybook end, sure. right? It's it's never perfect. I feel content. I, I I'm happy now doing what I'm doing, and uh, 
I look back on that as a year that didn't go according to plan, and you chalk it up and you move on. If you like that conversation we were having with Greg Olson, you ought to listen to the entire podcast. The Dale Jr. Download is available on all major podcast platforms.